Hey, what's up, everybody? Good to be with you again on my live stream. I think this is my third live stream, so thanks for joining me today. Good to be with you guys. Got a great, great time to share with you guys on the live stream tonight. I'm going to be sharing with you about uh, swarms and you know what swarms are all about. And I'm going to give you some hints, too, about how to maybe prevent them <laughs> and then how we're going to then we're going to talk a little bit about how you make a split, and that'd be fun. I know a lot of you are watching from all around the world, and that's pretty cool. I see a lot of you uh, familiar faces in the chat. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. It really means a lot to me. And um, trying out some new gear, new camera tonight, so if things go crazy, we'll recover <laughs> somehow. Um, but uh, I'm really excited about what's going on in my bee yard how things are really looking like spring. But I tell you, I'm a little worried because this is so unusual. I mean, it's bound to get colder. And when it does, you know, if, if I try to do anything like spring-like to my bees right now, it's a little risky. And so I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of just tapping the brakes a little bit. I don't want to uh, hit the gas too much just yet. I've, I've got a couple more months, but we'll watch it. I mean, today I was out there and I said, what if I just make a split? You know, what if it goes bad? it will just be a good little experiment, right? Then I was like, no, there's no way I can do that. <laughs> I can't do that. So uh, let's go ahead and get right into what I've prepared to share with you guys uh, tonight. I want to talk about uh, swarming because swarming is something that is challenging and it is really uh, frustrating when we get into swarming and we can't really control it. But um, my slide's messing up, maybe. But swarm preparations, you know, a colony just doesn't decide to swarm like in the morning. Like you wake up and you see them swarming. You might think, oh, they just decided it's a nice day and they took off. A lot of preparation goes into it. Bees uh, are pedandrous, which means the drones are made about two weeks before the queens are even produced by the hive. So there's a lot of time from when they start thinking about swarming until when they do, most of us feel like it's about 30 days. So when you see your swarm happening 30 days ago, they were starting to turn the crank and kind of get things rolling in that direction. So here's why bees swarm. They either swarm because they're very crowded or they just want to reproduce. All living animals, and bees are in the animal kingdom, there's plant kingdom and animal kingdom, and so bees are animals. Animals have to reproduce. That's something that they will do. And if they didn't, we wouldn't have extra bees. We wouldn't have the ability to have, be able to make packages. We have to have a lot of bees, new queens. That's just what bees do, they reproduce. Now, they can, re they can swarm from being overcrowded. Like if you just kept a bunch of bees in a really small place, they want to expand. They want to rapidly grow, and they can't. And uh, so they will reproduce and make another colony because they don't have enough room to continue to, to expand. But I've given my hives sometimes plenty of room, and they still swarmed. And that's because they want to reproduce. Some of you may think, oh, I'm going to put a honey super on, more honey supers. That way they won't swarm on me. They had plenty of room up in the supers. Now they're looking at their brood nest. But I'm going to tell you another thing that they're looking at. They're actually sampling or e experimenting, kind of monitoring is a better word, with the queen's mandibular pheromone, QMP. So in other words, this the queen's pheromone is being absorbed in all the bees. It kind of like cycles through the bees in the whole colony. And believe it or not, it makes its way back to the queen. And the queen can absorb her own pheromone as a signal if they should swarm or not. If it comes back strong, uh, then they're not as likely to swarm. But if it comes back weak, that means all that queen mandibular pheromone is being absorbed in all those bees, too many bees, and it can trigger uh, for them to start moving towards swarming. So swarming is something that's just an instinct of honeybees. They're gonna do it in the spring, and that's for sure. So we have to be concerned about that. The conditions have to be just right. 
for colonies to want to swarm. You got to have a strong colony. So a lot of you are coming out of winter. You might have a weak colony and they're not going to be so apt to swarm because they don't have enough muscle. They don't have enough energy, not enough bees, not enough resources. But if they're strong, if you're looking at your bees and you see a lot of bees, they're just reproducing, things look great, then they're, they have to swarm. That's, that's what they instinctively are genetically wired to do, to make more bees. They have to have drones present. They have to have good weather to make a swarm. They have to have plenty of resources. And I'm talking about you know good stores of protein, carbohydrates, and they themselves have to be well fed. So you'll have to watch for cell cups, and I'll show you a picture in just a minute, but you'll have to watch for these cell cups that develop on the lower part of the frames. Now, we always say that any, uh, frame, any, any cells that develop on the upper part of that frame is going to be a supersedure cell. That means they are replacing their old queen for some reason. And any cells that develop on the lower half of the deep frame we think of those as uh, swarm cells. And that's because it's just an area there where they can just oftentimes build those swarm cells in great numbers. Sometimes you can see five or 10, 20 on one single frame. Thank you, Castle Hive, for that donation of $10. I, I really do appreciate that. And uh, what you'll also notice before they swarm, there's about one or two days where there's very little foraging going on. So if all of your hives are foraging really well, you know, they're going in and out, but you see one that's like, what's wrong with this hive? There's not as much movement in and out. That's because they're getting ready to swarm. And to do that, they're consuming, they're, they're kind of filling up their honey crop with nectar so they can get ready to make a lot of wax when they swarm, have a lot of energy to fly a long way, sometimes a mile or more. So they have to really not go out and forage. They've got to reserve their energy to do that. And that happens about one or two days before they start uh, swarming. So you can look for that. That's another clue. So here's what happens when the trigger goes off. They've had 30 days to make things happen. All at once, they away they go. They literally just bleed out of the front of your hive. You, If you've never seen it, you're, you're just blown away at the amount of bees that are just spraying out of the front. Now, some are flying back in. I mean, there's, those are foragers that are just like, you know, I'm doing my job. I don't know why you guys are swarming, but that's not, I wasn't chosen. <laughs> Tom Seeley in his book, Democracy of the Honeybee, if you don't have that book, it's a real good one. He spent, a, he spent his life monitoring swarms. And so that's, uh, that's real important. So, um, I just got a message. I'll see if everything okay. Okay, so um, I, I feel like that that book would be really good if you watch that and you study it because he spent his life just looking at swarms. So, um, but they what what I picked up from his book was, um, let's see, give me a thumbs up, Brian. Brian, is everything okay? Okay, it, everything's okay. So, uh, so in Tom's book, he brought out the point. And after all of his study, is that when a hive swarms, it lands near the hive. But the bees that they choose to swarm is like a mixture of all different age bees. And even if you catch the swarm and throw them back in the same hive they left, then all at once, those are, the, those are different bees. It may not be the exact same bees again. So it's really kind of interesting to see uh, which bees are chosen to go each time. But they're made up of a lot of different ages. Now, when they first swarm, they leave and they land pretty close to your hive within about, you know, 10, 20 feet uh, from your hive, sometimes a little further away. They may land way up in a tree on your car bumper. <laughs> they may land on the bottom of my rocking chair if you saw that video, but they're not finished yet. That's just a regrouping position. And so they're there for an hour or for several days and they start doing a waggle dance. And I, I wanna talk to you about that. Oh, that video didn't work. It didn't look good for me. Uh, okay. So this waggle dance that they do, I'll just leave it right there though. This waggle dance is actually cool because all the bees on, this, on the front of the swarm will do a waggle dance. They're waggling different directions about a particular nesting site that they found. 
and each of the scout bees may have a different nesting site chosen. So you'll see bees in the red going that way and the yellow going that way. And I had all that perfect, but it didn't work. So all these waggle dances will be in different directions. So what I do when I'm trying to figure out how much time I have to capture that first landing swarm is I look because if they're all waggling the same direction, then they're all getting ready to lift any second. If they're waggling different directions, you have time because democracy hasn't set in yet and they're pretty divided. They're not really for sure which way to go. And so that's important if you're wanting to catch a swarm and you're wondering how long until they leave, just watch and look at the waggle dance and the waggle dance will tell you how soon they're going to leave. That's pretty exciting. Now, you may have heard this uh, phrase before, a swarm in May is worth a bale of hay. A swarm in June is worth a silver spoon, and a swarm in July ain't worth a fly. And so that's the timing of the year, usually, where you see more swarms in the spring. You'll see some in the summer, but later in, in the year, you don't see as many swarms. And the reason they're not worth as much in, 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 to the beekeeper is because they don't have a lot of time to get ready for winter, as a, a swarm in May does. And so if you catch a swarm kind of late, then you've got to do a lot because a swarm is about 10,000 bees, 20,000 at the most. So you got to do a lot of work to get them built up. So capture them on the first uh, swarm, the first time they land before they take off for their final nesting place. Bring some equipment, shake them into a box, make sure you get the queen, and then carry them off to your bee yard. Listen, here's a good tip. Put them where you want them to be forever. If you take them home, you set them in the yard, but that's not the final place, they'll start taking orientation flights. And then when you move them again, a lot of those bees are going to be confused and not follow their home to where you're going to move them. So when you finally catch a swarm and take it to your bee yard, put it where you're going to uh, want it to be forever. That's really important. So how do you prevent swarms from happening? I know a lot of us are thinking about that right now. It's extremely challenging. Again, they want to reproduce and they have a rapid spring buildup that affords all of this to be so challenging for us. But I'll give you some hints to try. Here's a picture that I took of one of my hives. You can see here, look at those swarm cells. You know, there's eight or nine of them just within that picture right there. And uh, they're kind of on the middle toward the lower part of the frame. So you can try to remove those. If you think, oh, they're getting ready to swarm, I see all these cells, they're not closed off at the bottom yet, I have some time. They usually don't swarm until those cells are closed off. So then the problem is when you try to control it by tearing out the queen cells, you're gonna miss some because in this case, there's not a lot of bees covering those because I kind of moved them off for the picture. But in most cases, bees will be covering those queen cells. And so you won't see to get every single one. All you have to do is leave one accidentally. That's enough for them to swarm. So that's, that's a lot of work. It's, it's labor intensive. You have to recheck it every 10 days. So if you don't want them to swarm and you want to make a lot of honey with all those bees, you have to just religiously go out there and tear out queen cells, queen cells, queen cells. And lo and behold, there's going to come a time when you're off at work. <laughs> so, something's going to happen when you're not looking and they're gonna get you and they're gonna swarm. And so one other tip I wanna caution you about, don't tear out cells unless you know for sure your original queen is in there. A lot of beekeepers will see those cells, they'll rip out every cell in there, not realizing the hive has already swarmed. And so now they've, the, the, the queen, the mother queen leaves, the old queen leaves with the swarm and you tear out all the cells, there hasn't been any eggs laid recently. And so therefore, there's no way they can raise a queen. You understand what I'm saying? So make sure they have a queen and hopefully their old queen is still there for you to prevent it. And then you can start knocking out, controlling those queen cells. That's real important. Now, my friend John Zivishlock uh, put this together a while back and I like how he illustrated it. I changed it up a little bit. So this is how I like to make splits. So we're talking about controlling splits or controlling swarms and making splits, uh, two birds with one stone. So you can see here, I hope this works. <laughs> um, you have your hive, it may be in two deeps, but one deep for simplicity. 
And so you want to move this kind of uh, frame configuration and the queen over to this split, this empty split. So I moved over uh, two or three frames of brood and then maybe two that are capped over one frame of open larvae is always good. And then a couple of frames of honey if you want to. And then you put other frames in its place, uh, any, any frames that are like um, uh, open spots. And you want to, I always move my queen into the hive that I'm making a split. For, so I take the old queen. By taking the old queen, the hive at home, they think they've already swarmed because the queen's gone. And I usually put undrawn comb in the place of the drawn comb that I took out. So what that means is they have to start drawing out comb, raise a new queen in the old hive. To them, that's a, I've just kind of I simulated a real swarm. And now I have almost uh, uh, almost two hives just by making a split. So that works out good for me. But you have to recheck uh, the hive that you took the queen out of, make sure they're raising their own, or you can buy or cage your own queen, but you can buy a queen and put that queen in there uh, after a while. So those are uh, just kind of a recap, kind of a re refreshment of you know, what do we do this time of the year when we want to make splits or we want to start uh, controlling our swarms? The best way to do it is by making a split, getting ahead of the game. Another way you can make splits is you can grab frames uh, that have those queen cells on them, as long as you know your original queen is still there, and you can move those frames with queens on them into a different place, a uh, different hive. You can just start expanding your bee yard in that way. So you have two options. You have the option of, of splitting your hives uh, and making more hives or trying to keep them together and controlling them. Uh, at what temperature can I unwrap the hive after winter? It really depends on where you live and kind of what your condition of your hive is. If it's not getting below freezing much anymore, not getting much below you know, your 20s Fahrenheit, then unwrapping them would probably be fine if they're a large size uh, colony. They can make enough heat to withstand that. If you get back down into the teens and single digits, the colony is sort of small, you know, it's probably good to wrap it. But here's the thing. Right now, if your hive is wrapped and we have warm-up days in the 40s and 50s, the wrap is actually preventing some of the heat from the sun to hit the box and provide warmth in the box. So you kind of want to keep that in mind as well. You don't always want to keep the wraps on even when it starts to warm up. Add the late swarms with smaller hives. Uh, that's a little more tricky um, because you had the queen issue uh, at that point. So, you know, you will have to consider a newspaper addition, like using a newspaper to combine the hives. And if it's not really warm outside, that newspaper is separating the two um, I look at uh, combining hives as something more I do in the fall or late summer when I have a weak colony, but you could certainly do it. I, I have done that before. That was something I thought about today when I saw, you know, the little hive that I have in a super, this tiny little hive. I thought, man, I could, I could combine it with another hive. Uh, but then I thought, well, what do I do with the queen? The two, I have two queens. I don't know what I do with two queens. Uh, would you split, uh, a hive composed of two double deep 10 frame hives into two single double deep hives. Uh, two double deep 10 frame hives into two single deeps. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Two single double deep hives. Isn't that the same thing? Two double deep 10 frames into two single deep double deep 10 frames. Um, I don't know if you're asking, but it's easy. Uh, one of the things I consider that you've probably heard the phrase as a walkaway split. And a lot of times that's like when you have two deeps that are in a double deep hive, they're just full uh, in both deeps. You can just take the top deep, walk away with it. And it doesn't really, you don't really care which one that has the queen, right? As long as both have eggs, whichever one doesn't have the queen will raise, or whichever one doesn't have the queen, as long as they have eggs, they'll raise that queen for you. So that's important to consider too. Always have eggs if you make those splits like that. How many rounds of brood would you wait to make a split? Um, yeah. Um, 
as long as I have a frame or two of brood, I'm okay making that split. Um, because, you know, when I make up the five frame nucleuses that we sell, you know, we start off with two, maybe three frames of brood in those and they build up really fast. So as long as I have a couple of frames of brood in those uh, splits, I, I think they need two. I feel like two kind of keeps, a, establishes a brood nest area and it allows a little bit more nurse bees to be on two frames. So two would be my minimum, but, you know, three, maybe even four would help it take off to a, a real good start. All right. Found an abandoned hive on a property in November, heavy with bees. What threshold of mites do I need to get to before I make a split? That's a good question. And, you know, I often say when I, when I make this presentation, and I think it's in my, um, my spring management online course, I say that you really shouldn't make your splits until you get your mites under control. That's not always an option due to the weather, but if you can, you know, if you, if you take a mite test, you see what mite levels you have, then you can start treating for mites in that large colony before you split it. Um, it just works out well. If you split it and it's small and it's a, it's a, it's a small split, then you're gonna have to think through how you treat it because the measurements of your treatment are gonna have to be calculated down. Sometimes the label doesn't provide that and you're guessing at how to treat them. But if you have a, a large colony, you can figure out how to treat those mites before you split them. I think that that's a good idea. You know, I thought about talking about the Demary, uh, Demary split. We have to know that. It's, it's a good thing to know. I have a whole presentation on it. There's not enough time tonight to even touch that. It's, it's basically kind of moving frames around in another box on top and kind of just, it's a lot of work. It's so much work. I tried it once because, you know, we had to know it for the master beekeeper test one time and I tried it. Oh my gosh. It's so much easier to walk up to a big hive, pull out four or five frames, put them in a deep box with the bottom board and top, walk away with that, with that queen, you're done. It's over. So I just don't like to spend a lot of time uh, manipulating my frames and watching, going back and watching again, tearing out queen cells. But if you want to do that, uh, Damari, uh, Dimery uh, or whatever it's called. If you want to do that method, uh, study it good and read about it first. Know what you're doing because it's pretty intense on, on how to do that. Hey, let's take a moment and let's give away a queen rearing course. I know a lot of you are online tonight uh, having watched some of my recent videos on how to raise your own queens. And I thought it'd be good for us to... Um, uh, give you guys a chance to get the queen ring course, the online queen ring course that we offer. I think it's uh, about $69. So it's a, a great savings if you uh, want to try for that. What we're going to do, we're going to, all you have to do to be eligible to win, we'll pick one winner, is select or put in the comment, hashtag free, capital F-R-E-E. -E. Make, make it all uh, capitalized, I think. So leave comment, hashtag free, and we'll let that go for a while. I'll start collecting the comments and then we'll draw one of you for winning the online queen ring course. Just leave a comment, hashtag free. Now this, this course is gonna help you in the spring because a lot of times you wanna start raising queens to put in those splits. If you, if you make a split and you don't wanna wait 30 days for them to raise their own queen, then you can certainly just uh, already have some queens raised Maybe they're in mating nooks, uh, just came back and they're laying good or something. So learning how to raise your queens, that's money. I'll tell you, that is that is so cool when more people learn to raise their own queens. So hashtag free in the comment and you will, one of you will be selected to win um, the uh, queen rearing course. I appreciate that. Um, I really appreciate all of you for joining me tonight. Uh, it means a lot to me. And I know some of you might be new to uh, live streaming. So thank you. If you're an old hat at it, uh, thanks for stopping by. All right, let me start collecting some comments. Let's see here. All right, we've got 48 entries for the Queen online Queen Ring course that you could win for free. I know some of you may have already downloaded it. Um, let me show you something else here. Oh yeah. Uh, I was going to put the link to this, and I forgot, but this is Raising Quality Queens that Dr. John Zavishlock 
and I wrote. And it's a good book with a lot of good descriptions on how to raise uh, queens. And I think I showed you this one of the other live streams. I teach you how to graph in here, graft. Uh, very, very good booklet. We wrote it simple so that you could learn it quickly, know how to do it. This is pretty handy. Um, boy, I have no idea where to tell you to get this. It, I know it's available free for download. It's a PDF file from the Division of Agriculture, University of Arkansas. I was going to put a link, but I don't know where it is now. Sorry. But you can go to our website. I think probably our, the link is somewhere on our website at honeybeesonline.com. That's a good book. Thank you, uh, Elisa, for that $5 super sticker. Those of you that leave super stickers and super uh, super thanks or super chats, that means a lot to me when you do that. It really does. I, I really do appreciate that. All right, let's see. We're at 78. And uh, let me share that screen so you can see who is going to be the winner. All right, give me a second here to find it. Okay, share the screen. All right, we're going to draw from the 78. You go over here and hit draw. All right. All right, let's see who the winner is going to be of the online queen rearing course. Look at the names. Mm, get it. Oh, Eric, Eric Wilhelm, you won the online queen rearing course. So good for you. And I uh, hope queen rearing is something that you want to do because you just uh, want a whole free class of me teaching you just like this with a lot of things in there to, to guide you. Thank you, Thomas, for that $20 donation. By the way, when you uh, leave a donation, you're able to bring your question in front of my face. It just stands there. It won't go away. I have to answer it. Some of the other questions I want to answer, but as the... So as, as the comments go by and I'm talking, I may not see it. <laughs> so I can't, I can't miss those. Uh, Thomas, uh, does a queen incubator need an air in inlet so they don't suffocate? Uh, it's interesting. I think it has built in. I wish I had mine close to me. I don't. Uh, my queen incubators are actually... Um, chicken egg incubators. I buy them at farm stores. I used to get them for $20, $30. They're pretty affordable. And it has a thermostat that is so accurate that I can set to about 92.5. I put a little moisture in there and you can really uh, set that. They come with fans or without fans. And I've ran both with fans and without fans. I've had no difference on success of incubating my um, actual uh, queens that I have in there. Sometimes I have to have put those queen cells in there like on day 12, day 13, uh, because I've, I've backlogged my mating nooks or something and I have to go take those queens out before I put the new queens in. So I just have to hold them in an incubator and they'll emerge in the incubator. So I've got queen protectors. I put moisture in there. I don't, I'm going to look tonight um, and see if there's any air vents, but there's enough air in there, and I lift it open quite frequently. So it's never been something I've ever thought about. This year is going to be my first time grafting. And for the first time, and split over a double screen board for the first time. Have any tips on suggestions? I normally do walkaway splits. Thanks, Dave. Well, I'm glad you're going to be doing some grafting uh, and split over a double screen board for the first time. Uh, take it that you mean you're going to divide your colony with a double screen board um, and have one colony above another one, it sounds like. That's what you're going to do a split over. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that would work. I, I've never, I've done things like that before. I've tried to overwinter through a double screen like that too and not had good luck. Um, I've tinkered around with a lot of things and just, I always fall back to what is simple for me, what I have the equipment for. I don't have any double screens anymore. A lot of people think you can do that with a queen excluder, but let me caution you, that queen excluder actually affords one queen to actually grab a hold of the other queen and they can fight because the queen excluder is too thin, either plastic or metal. So the, the double, like if you put two queen excluders or if you uh, doubled them up like that, that would help. But using just a one screen, like your bottom board screen or something, no, that's, 
that's too close. They'll grab each other and fight. So you have to be careful about that too. Uh, I think that's real critical. Um, so I think it's going to be one of those things where when you decide how you want to split what works for you, what kind of equipment you have, um, that's the way that you should really split your hive. And I think that's real important to do what's simplest for you, do what's easiest for you. I, I think that's cool. Hey, guys, I went out to uh, Nevada. I started my first talk. I actually was doing a workshop on uh, getting bees through the winter. My first workshop at like 845. And uh, right, off the, right off the bat, I said Nevada. <laughs> I, said, I said the word Nevada. And it, immediately I was corrected. Immediately it said Nevada. You know, and it was like it was so hard for me to give up saying something that I said wrong that many years. So I started teasing. and I said, well, how do you say the state where I'm from? And a lot of people did say Illinois with an S. So those of you that don't know about my state, you don't say the S. You say Illinois. And that's just something that is kind of tough. <laughs> I, I look at your names, too, and sometimes I don't know how to pronounce your names. I am really good at really butchering up words uh, when they're spelled out right in front of me. Okay, I was really shaky starting to graph queens. I learned you have to uh, rest the palm of your hand on the comb to anchor it. It really helps. Yeah, uh, Gary, you can actually uh, build things, you know, set your grafting frame down and support apparatus, whether it's a book or a couple of books, you have to build something out of wood, put something up there so that you can uh, prop your hand up. Yeah. Well, here is uh, Jay Clark. Hel uh, Helton says, uh, David Sherry, thank you for sacrificing your time, money, and efforts to help us become better beekeepers. Much appreciated. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Uh, Sherry and I spend so much time doing that. And I'm going to tell you a secret for you that are live streaming with me. When Sherry and I started many, many years ago in beekeeping business-wise, Thanks again, uh, Thomas, for your donation. I, I really do appreciate that. Um, Sherry and I kind of, was we were ahead of the game. There wasn't a lot of e-commerce out then. We were kind of trailblazing e-commerce, how to figure out. We were designing our own websites. I was HTML coding my own websites. And we were figuring out everything, you know, in technology. And now it's so much easier. Now you just go online, grab a website, you know, e-commerce is figured in for you. Gosh, but we have put some blood, sweat, and tears, especially Sherry. Sherry does all of the business work. She, she uh, does all of, the, all of the administrative things. That's amazing. So thank you. New beekeeper here, and I'm researching different hives. What's your opinion on Apimay hives? Very good. I uh, appreciate that question a lot, and I do get that question a lot. I actually made a video this week, just a few days ago, about this very question and explained it to you. Um, my opinion of the Appa May Hive, I have one, and I think they're cool. They have a lot of benefits to them. Uh, they do have uh, an occasional drawback when it comes to maybe trying to put a winter bee kind on there or feeding and all, but there's all of those things are, are workarounds that you can fix. I know Brian has them, and so... Um, I always recommend that you start with something like a Langstroth hive. And I know an Apime hive is, is basically a Langstroth hive, but I'm talking about your traditional Langstroth that you don't have to really think much about what to do because most of the studies, most of the extra uh, equipment has been built around a lot of the Langstroth hives. If you start that way, first off, right out of the chute as a new beekeeper, beekeeper then you can learn the practice of beekeeping and then you can move over um, into a place where you can experiment with uh, different hives. I think that's critical too. Uh, Thomas asks, should queens be shipped with nurse bees? Good question. Here's when I'm ready to ship a queen, uh, here's the way I do it. I always put nurse bees in there, always. Uh, I put more nurse bees if it's, I think it's cooler out there, but I'll always put at least three nurse bees. In some studies that I was observing in a university and helping with some research, um, we noticed that in a, a queen cage like that, uh, it was simulating a queen cage, there was only one nurse bee 
that was actually taking care of the queen, only one. So I throw three in there so that whichever one, I'll hopefully get the one that'll take care of her. But um, my secret weapon, yeah, Sherry is a hero. She is the hero behind the scenes. Yay, Sherry. Oh my gosh, Sherry is, and, you know, we, I, I can't even begin to tell you that Sherry will tweak, like you guys order something from our website and she'll notice the shipping is off. You know, it's like, oh, the shipping's off. She will spend hours tweaking the product design measurements and UPS to get the shipping right. She'll refund your money if you're overcharged, but she'll think, how do I get that correct? It's amazing. But I, I really think that nurse bees, but my secret weapon, and I'll share it with you, is you got to put a little water, cover the screen with water before you ship it. That's key. Not honey. Just if you take water on your finger and cover the screen, the, the wooden screen, the wooden cage with a screen on it and let the water stick to that cage, ship it. It's good. That's, that works so well. What type of bee do you recommend for a new beekeeper? Whew, that's a good question. I think we would love to believe that there are queens like there are dogs. Like you can get a German Shepherd. You can get a, a Dachshund. You can get all the different poodles, a, a purebred. A, you know, all these, they come with papers and they're perfect. No, it's not going to happen with bees. I'm sorry to tell you, it's just not going to happen. Not going to happen. Now, if you say I got, I'm getting a Carniolan, I'm getting an Italian, a Buckfast, okay, mm, probably not. Now, are you getting some of the traits that are heavily in that uh, type of bee? Hope so. You hope so, right? Sometimes you can tell by the color, but maybe not. The best bee that you can get is one that is from a hive, the best queen, from a hive that has been very impressive. That's the best way to go, in my opinion. I do love the work of, of like John Harbo, Corey Stevens, others that are working to make a varroa sensitive hygienic queen. Um, the, that's, that work is, needs to be really complemented and, and move forward there. But I really think all in all right now, um, you should select to raise queens out of your most productive hive. If you're buying a queen as a new beginner, um, just make sure you're getting them from a good source that other people have really uh, said that are good quality queens. That's the best way to do it. Thank you so much for the grand advice. Love your spring class. Can't wait to do my splits and graph this year. Yeah, thank you. The, the spring class is really good. It helps the online spring course helps you deal with um, um, getting ready to harvest honey, getting ready to have more honey production, splits and swarms. Absolutely. When you split the colony, do you use a double screen board? I think I just mentioned that a double screen board. Uh, not sure what that means. Ask the ask the question again, but explain what you're doing, and I can be more descriptive. It's I'm not sure of what approach you're doing. Yep. Okay, let's go ahead and offer another uh, class now, friends. This class that I'm going to offer this time is actually going to be our ultimate class. It's going to be our ultimate giveaway course. If I can get this set up again. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this would be seven of our online courses and it will include the queen course. And so we're gonna actually offer um, uh, all seven courses in our ultimate course. Let me pick a word here. Let me find that word. All right, it looks like the word is going to be, let me, let me, let me put it in here first. All right, it's gonna be, and I wanna tell you until I get it in here. Start collecting. Okay, there we go. The word is hashtag class, C-L-A-S-S, -S, hashtag class. And if you'll put that in the comments, then we will draw someone who's going to win our ultimate online beekeeping course here in just a few minutes. That's cool. We'll let these uh, kind of go in there. We've had 17 of you already trying for the ultimate class. This ultimate class is queen rearing, spring management, uh, what to do with your bees in the spring, how to get your bees through the winter, mite control, a day in the apiary with David. Oh my gosh, what are the other two? Uh, oh, advanced class, advanced beekeeping, more pests and diseases. And I can't remember the seventh one off the top of my head, but so seven of them, uh, 
all together. So that'll keep you busy. When you uh, purchase one of our online courses, you'll get a link immediately with um, that takes you to the courses. And when you go through your first course, I have worksheets that you follow and the courses are in those worksheets, the links to every class, you have to scroll down. Some people take the first course and think they only got one, but they're not scrolling down and seeing the next course, the next course, the next course. <laughs> okay. All right, we have 150 of you that have uh, put in hashtag class. If you're watching this um, after the live stream and you're trying to win the course after like three days from now, it's not gonna work. So no reason to comment if you're watching this when it's not live. So those of you watching live right now, you get the freedom and the choice, the privilege of putting hashtag class to win the ultimate course. So that's great. I really appreciate that. Um, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, any other questions that any of you want to ask me relating to beekeeping or anything, I guess? <laughs> All right. Let me get ready to share my screen here. There we go. Share screen, all right. All right, we have 167 of you that are ready to draw. It's growing, 170. Come on, get in there. Get in on the ultimate queen ring class that you could win guys that'd be great also give me a thumbs up if you are enjoying this uh live stream and uh, i always want to encourage you to please subscribe uh to my youtube channel my youtube channel is growing so fast i really appreciate it almost 107,000 subscribers and it's all because of you guys mean so much to me and anytime you watch one of my videos please give me a thumbs up that helps all my videos get pushed around on youtube a lot more all right i'm going to uh, give 10 more seconds for you to get in and be eligible to win the online beekeeping course. So get in on that. Oh, some of you are getting in. Here we go. Countdown 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, hashtag class, hashtag class, 4, 3. This is like when I used to watch Batman and there was like 10 seconds left, you know. It was like 20 minutes. It took 20 minutes for the 10 seconds to run out. All right, here we go. Who is going to win the ultimate online beekeeping course that Sherry will keep track of? That'd be great. Oh, there you go. I cannot pronounce that name. Mubraka uh, Umar. So congratulations. That's pretty awesome that you won that. So here's how. Here's what you guys need to do if you have won that class. Uh, let me just show you here. Uh, you need to probably send Sherry. Yep, send Sherry an email, and let me show you what it is. Send the uh, the winner only. Only email Sherry at longlanehoneybees at gmail .com and let her know you won. Let her know what class you won. She's keeping track, of course. But if you'll let her know, that will be a ton of help to her. Thank you. All right, you know, Sherry and I are glad to uh, help you guys out by occasionally giving out some free advice or be these free classes. That's great. What do you feel is the best way to get rid of hive beetles? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. If you live in the south of the U.S., beetles are, are really tough to get rid of. I am a small hive beetle in, uh, expert because uh, many, many years ago, I brought up 100 colonies out of Florida that were just so many beetles in there, and I was educated very quickly. Um, but the best way is to use traps, the old traps between frames. Um, if you're mildly, mildly infected with small hive beetle, you can put some of those oil traps. They just let, sit in between the frames, put about a quarter inch on the bottom of vegetable oil. Oil will kill bees, so try not to spill it. Be careful when you take your uh, hive apart and put it on edge. If you do that, uh, oil will drip out. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> um, so... You can use beetle traps. Um, there's a lot of other methods, you know, the, the dryer vent paper or the dryer uh, uh, swift paper that you can put in there that kind of gets the, the mite stuck. There's a lot of different ways. You can bait them in your hive with some vinegar oil. 
vinegar smell, apple vinegar. I'm never going to put something in my hive that's going to attract small hive beetle. I may put it in your hive, <laughs> but I'm not going to put it in my hive. I don't want anything attracting small hive beetles. That's the other thing. Keep your yard clean. Don't throw excess wax on the ground. You know, clean up after yourself. Don't leave honey laying around the bee yard. Uh, but just going after them, smashing them, smashing them, smashing them. Uh, what about toxic honey? I, I learned recently my grandparents have this Japanese plant next door from us and makes toxic honey, can be dangerous. I've had many discussions about this with experts that know more about toxic honey than I do. And for the most part, they've always told me that like rhododendron is another one that has been linked to making some people act crazy. Um, but the way I understand it, there's usually not as much of it available uh, to once it's mixed into all the other sources of nectar the bees are getting. But I think if you do live in a place where known uh, uh, toxic honey is, is available from plants, then move the bees somewhere else. We did talk about this in Nevada. Uh, somebody brought that up. And I remember uh, Cameron Jack spoke about that, or maybe it was David Wick. I can't remember. One of them talked about that. But about all you can do is get your bees off of it or away from it, not be around it. That, that's a good question. Boy, don't spend time worrying about that, right? I mean, it, it's not one of those things you're going to worry about uh, too much at all. I have a brand new hive body out as a swarm trap with lemongrass and extra wax foundation. What would you suggest to help boost my chances of catching a swarm? Hmm. Sounds like you've done everything. It sounds They're in a deep hive body. Um, if you get them up in the air, I think that's going to help a little bit. If you get them about 10 to 20 feet up, I think that can probably increase your chance. The lemongrass oil is good. Uh, there's swarm commander. There's a lot of these pheromone smells, these odors that you can put in there. And I understand there's, you can just do some search on swarm catcher, swarm commander. And I know some of this works better than others. I've actually seen some work very well. So try to uh, play around with that a little bit, but you're doing the right things. If you had drawn comb, I think you said it, you had foundation, but if you had drawn comb, that's going to go a long way too. That will help a bit. Um, but you sound like you're doing anything you've, uh, everything you already mentioned. Can you talk about installing a nuke? Um, if you have made the box and you have your five frame nucleus box and you want to uh, start with a nuke, start it like you would make a split. Move over what you would think would make sense if you were a honeybee. You want a couple of frames of brood. You want, a, you want one frame of capped over brood. Let me check the clock. Okay, so one frame of uh, capped over brood means that those bees are going to emerge any minute. And when they do, they're going to become nurse bees in six days and take care of what the queen is laying. You see what I mean? You want to have capped brood at least one to two frames. That's your workforce that's closest to being your workforce. Now, a frame of open brood is you want to stagger it. So a frame of larvae, eggs larvae, that's going to be good. That's staggering your workforce. And then you want the rest of the frames, the other two, to be honey, pollen, something they can eat on while they're also collecting. So that's that's a good balance. It's kind of like making a starter hive. Oh, do I have a preference on darker or lighter honey? No, I really don't. I like it all. When I eat uh, uh, buckwheat honey, that takes a lot for me to get used to. I am, wow, buckwheat is just like nothing like I've ever tasted. It doesn't even taste like honey. So every time, you know, if you blindfold me and, and make me eat uh, buckwheat, uh, I can't tell if you're putting molasses in my mouth or what. It's just like, whoa. So any any honey that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, light to mid dark is probably my favorite. Um, but you know, orange blossom sometimes is dark, but a lot of times it's kind of mid colored. That's by the way, I saw a chart the other day. I'm going to have to buy it. I can't remember where I saw it. It was a chart that showed all the available pollen at different times of the year and what color the pollen is and what plants or trees it's from. And if that plant or tree has any nectar associated with it as well. It gave little indicators about how much nectar it produced. So some plants just produce the pollen and very little nectar. 
a lot of plants produce a lot of nectar, very little honey. Um, I mean, very little pollen. So it was a great little chart. That's how I found out what some of the colors were that my bees were bringing back in. I was like, oh, look at that green. Where's that green coming from? Oak trees. It's like pretty cool. And so I love doing that. I only have one hive due to regulations here in Los Angeles. How do I prevent swarming or do I only have the removing of queen cells option? I don't know. Try this. Removing queen cells is one option. Um, if you start feeling like they're going to swarm, you could put a queen excluder between the bottom board and the bottom deep. The queen can't leave. They, if they swarm, they would just kind of go back in because they realize, uh, where's mama? Uh, she didn't come out with us. Okay, forfeit. Let's go back in the hive. Problem is you can't leave that on very long because your drones aren't able to go out on their mating flights. Um, so they will clog it up and they will die wanting to get out and it'd be a mess and it could cause your whole colony to uh, die. So you can do that temporarily. Like if you see that you have queen cells and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have time to deal with that today. What do I do? I know they're going to swarm any minute. Throw the queen excluder on the bottom board where the queen can't get out. Make sure there's no other entrances above it, of course, or a hold in the side. But that way it, get, it buys you some time. Um, giving them room to expand if they're, if they're swarming only because they're crowded, you can give them room to grow. And, uh, but again, reproduction swarm, <laughs> you know, it's like telling teenagers uh, not to get in the back seat of a car, you know, you can say that to your blue in the face, but there's something about reproductive instincts that's powerful for bees and they're going to want to do that. So, wow. Where do I get my unroasted coffee? You know, I can't remember. I buy it online. I buy it from something called Smoky, Smoking Beans, maybe. I wish I had that link. I think it's in the link of my, all my videos I make. I think I'll leave it at the bottom. But Sherry and I have tried something different recently. We've been doing pour over coffee. It's a cool little um, glass uh, pot and it has a filter. And I, I grind my own, I roast my beans and I grind them and I pour them in the filter. And then we take hot uh, water and let the hot water go over the roasted beans down into this uh, craft, this, this glass. Uh, and it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun doing it. I, I, I really do like that. How often do you replace your queens? And thanks so much for what you do. I've learned so much. Um, if I'm not lazy and I don't have a ton of stuff that's keeping me out of my hives, I love to do it once a year. I really do. I always like to replace my queens after the summer solstice, which is June the 21st, I think. So if I can replace my queens um, right at summertime, it, it does a lot. And so I, I like doing that. Do I always do that? Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't. I, I guess I'm a little bit lazy in that, but it, I've had so much better luck, so much better hives in the spring when I have a, a new queen that is uh, carrying that hive into the spring. I think there's less swarming when you have a new, a new queen in the spring Maybe her pheromones are more stronger. So once a year, if you raise your own queens, it doesn't cost anything like I do. It's real easy to do. If you buy your own queens, I would not do it once a year because I don't want to pay the 40 to 70 bucks it's going to cost to get a new queen. I'll, I'll just, I just wouldn't do that. But certainly I would not let a queen go more than two years. Two years out of her and I'm done. Um, yeah, I've tried the Miller method. I've tried, you know, I was preparing to share a ton of different ways to split hives with you guys. So many different ways. It was just going to bring confusion to so many new beginners that I just couldn't drown you with that information. Um, and again, I have found a way that works really good for me and I can't imagine anything working better. <laughs> so I just don't tinker around with anything different. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know if I've ever done the Miller or not, but it is interesting. Getting two nukes in April, is it more advantageous to feed them and reclaim the honey versus sugar water? Um, depending on where you live, when you get a nucleus, I don't think you really need to feed them because a nuke provider is giving you five frames, hopefully, and in those five frames, 
they are, you know, they have honey in there. They have pollen. They have honey already as part of the five frame nuke. I, I don't think you have to feed them. And then you're getting them late enough in the year because like we produce our five frame nukes from overwintered Illinois colonies that we raise queens for. So we can't produce them in April. It's going to be late May. By that time, there's stuff out there. So I would not feel like you would need to feed. Now you have to feed packages because you're getting them in March and April way too early and there's nothing out there usually. And so you have to feed them because they're, they have been raised on flowers in out West or in the South and you bring them up into snow in the North and they have nothing to eat. So you have to feed your packages. I'm going to take two more questions and then we're going to call it quits for the evening. David, while setting up at five frame nuke, from a split, what five frames do you recommend putting in them? Yeah, I already mentioned that, Charlie. A couple of frames of brood, one frame of cat brood, one frame of eggs and larvae, uh, and three frames of brood scattered about. But you definitely want a frame of, of good bee bread or pollen and a good frame of honey in there. So you have staggered brood and you have enough food in there to help them. Getting another message there. <laughs> okay. One more question. I'm going to take one more and then we're going to uh, appreciate uh, all of you coming back for this uh, live stream tonight. I really do enjoy the live streams, talking with you guys a lot. I want to give a shout out to Sherry, who is managing the comments and pasting things up like that, as well as Brian from Castle Hives. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sherry. Um, it's a lot to ask two people to give up a lot of time like that. So I appreciate it. All right, final question for the evening. David, all the equipment I purchased to start out this spring was screen bottom boards. Do you prefer the insert in or out for winter? I prefer, now let me say this before I answer. It's really your call. It's something you're going to have to decide where you live, how cold it is based on your bees. But for me, I don't like an insert. I got a couple of hives out there today to, uh, this winter that are solid bottom boards, just doing some fun stuff with them. But I don't like solid bottom boards. I started beekeeping with that. Reason I don't like it is because they're messy coming out of winter usually. And um, the recent test that I did a couple of years ago with a solid bottom board, it was so the bee survived great, as they do with my screen bottom boards wide open. But there was so much stuff on the bottom that small hive beetle had the, the larvae had burrowed down into all that crud on the solid bottom board. And they had laid eggs down there and it was just full of larvae down there. So I thought, oh, I don't, I don't like that. Where I have screen bottom board, more things fall through and it's pretty cool. So uh, Sherry wants to remind us Facebook giveaways are taking uh, place all uh, this week in the first week of March. So go to Honeybees online, look for our Facebook page. We have giveaways on our Facebook page. So that's really cool. Okay, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you being with me tonight. It has been a pleasure. I appreciate all the donations you guys made. That, that means a lot to me. And uh, all of you know, a lot of you know each other on the live stream. I'm going to try to do this every Thursday unless something else pulls me away. That does happen. But I'll try my best to be here every Thursday. So thank you guys so much for being here. It's a pleasure. And I will see all of you next Thursday. <laughs>